Good morning, everybody. I'm Alan Halakmi. I'm a Senior Manager of Solutions Architecture at AWS. We have a great panel here for you this morning. Uh, I think you'll find all of this to be quite interesting. Uh, we've tried to tailor this to areas of interest to a broad kind of cross-section of public sector. And so I think everybody will find something that relates. So by way of introduction, I'd like to actually start with the questions and just ask each of the folks on the panel here to uh, have you introduce yourself, uh, your name, the organization you represent, and the constituency that you represent. I'm Matthew Smith. Uh, I'm the Director of Cybersecurity Solutions at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, DHS has a fairly exciting mission in information security. Uh, aside from uh, having responsibility for the civilian government at large and uh, working with, in partnership with the uh, Office of Management and Budget uh, and the National Institutes of Standards and Technology um, and Commerce, we actually do kind of uh, set the standards and lead the way in information security for the civilian side of the federal government. Uh, working with the DHS CIO and CISO, uh, in that case, uh, are often called upon to meet with other uh, peers and groups within federal government to set strategy and to figure out how we're going to do many of the thou shouts that will often come first before the how. Uh, and in that organization, I'm also the technical representative to our member of the Joint Authorization Board for FedRAMP. Uh, the only U.S. government-wide FISMA uh, program that's responsible for setting the security and privacy standards and assuring compliance with those standards for the federal government's use of cloud services. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Richard from the U.K.'s National Cybersecurity Center. Um, the U.K. National Cybersecurity Center is a relatively new organization. Our role is to um, advise on security, cybersecurity for the UK public sector, uh, critical national infrastructure, and increasingly um, a much broader remit to, to kind of uh, protect the, um, the kind of uh, people and businesses operating in the UK as well. Good morning. My name is John Brady. I am CISO at FINRA. Uh, for those who are not familiar with FINRA, we are a, our, our name stands for Financial Regulatory Authority, but we're focused on the stock market business. Uh, we regulate the broker-dealers and the stock exchanges. And as part of that mission uh, in regulating the stock markets, we process a very large amount of data. We pull in all of the trades, the orders, the order routing events, the cancels, the fills, um, everything that occurs in the markets and all the systems that connect to them and stitch it all together every day to, to make sure you know, that it all adds up uh, and protects individual investors like you and me. Okay, good morning. I'm Scott Midkiff, the CIO at Virginia Tech. And in that role, uh, we provide services to uh, about 40,000 uh, students, staff, and faculty, as well as uh, additional alumni and other affiliates. Um, our campus is sort of a small city, right, because we have uh, residential facilities, dining facilities, a police department, uh, HVAC systems, all those kinds of things, as well as the research and, and education missions of the university. In addition to uh, IT services for Virginia Tech itself, uh, Virginia Tech has also been charged with uh, executing and delivering what's called the Virginia Cyber Range, which is part of Governor McAuliffe's cybersecurity initiatives. And the idea of the Virginia Cyber Range is to really be able to uh, deliver uh, cybersecurity educational resources to uh, students, K-12, community college, and uh, universities across Virginia to really improve the quality of cybersecurity education as well as the number of students that have access. Very well, so again, I want to welcome you all and thank you for your time this morning. Um, maybe I'll start with Richard. Sure. Um, so governments and cybersecurity agencies around the world, um, they focus on developing standards and offering guidance, and my, my observation is that's not quite what's happening at the UK at the National Cybersecurity Center, so why don't you share with us why you folks seem to be, I'll say, bucking the trend. Thanks for the question. Um, so. 
we, whilst we do offer guidance to um, the organisations that we're trying to help, we're also, we also, a couple of years ago, did a bit of research um, with our user community around what they, what they really wanted from us. And one of the overriding messages that we heard back from them was, you know, we needed to get our hands dirty, stop telling them what to do, and actually help them go and, you know, help them mitigate some of the problems that they face. And when we created the, the National Cybersecurity Centre, we, we set up quite an ambitious programme that we've called Active Cyber Defence, which is a, a programme of, of work that wants to tackle in a relatively automated and, and um, very scalable way a load of the, the, the cybersecurity problems that we, we face in the UK. So to do that, we've got um, kind of two kind of sets of problems. First of all, there are uh, kind of systemic issues that we're trying to fix in um, the way that traffic is routed on the internet and the fact it's possible to reroute someone's traffic without, you know, without their, their authorization in a way. So that's, that's through some controls that we're, we're trying to implement with BGP routing on the internet. Um, we're doing something similar uh, with SS7 about to try and protect or try and um, tackle the problem of uh, SMS message spoofing. Uh, so that's, that's one set of problems. The second set is around kind of testing our security in a, in a very automated way. And we're starting with pub the public sector for that. So we've got projects, um, so we've got a project called WebCheck, which is about continually testing the security of all of our websites, uh, looking for misconfigured certificates, checking that they support TLS in a sensible way, um, looking for kind of low-hanging fruit, so that when we, when we pay for a penetration test, the penetration testers have to, you know, they can't just run a basic scanner across our services. They have to work a little bit harder to find bugs, which is um, just helping us raise the bar. As well as uh, websites, um, we're doing similar for email services. So we've got a, a, a service called MailCheck that we're building, which will test um, the email security of, of all of our 3,500.gov.uk domains. And then after that, we'll look at .police.uk and .nhs.uk as well. Um, and then uh, we're also, the other one, the other kind of service that I want to mention that we're, we're building for the public sector, which is really cool, is a DNS service. So when a, if a user is kind of tricked into clicking a link in a phishing email, um, when their browser makes a, a DNS request um, that tries to take them to a known bad site, and that's a site that we, you know, we've, we've, we know is bad through um, commercial intelligence sources or, or through our own intelligence sources, that um, we're able to redirect them to safety. So that's, that's a service that we're, uh, we're building um, in partnership with Nominet, the, the UK, .uk DNS, um, .uk registrar. So just a, a quick follow-up. <clears throat> so you're, you're building these services, and, and I wonder, and I'm thinking specifically about MailTrick, um, how do you handle, um, if you will, kind of containing the kind of explosion when malware comes in the door? What technologies are you using to, to protect the environment? Uh, so with, with MailCheck, what we're trying to do is use a lot of the serverless technologies. Um, this is because we, we want our service to scale in a very elegant way, but the, the kind of non-persistent nature of um, some of the serverless technologies like Lambda means that if we did have a compromise, because we're, you know, we're, we're processing potentially very nasty email, um, that that wouldn't be a long-lived uh, issue for us. It would be, you know, it would be a short-term problem. Very well. Uh, so, Matt, I, I spend a lot of time dealing with federal customers and federal civilian space. And so I'd, I'd love to ask, could you describe how the US government has traditionally approached perimeter security and maybe the challenges with this approach and how DHS is rethinking it? Sure. Well, speaking on behalf of DHS or the whole federal government is a, is a weighty <laughs> task. So. I think this is probably the point where I throw in that, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've worked in dot-com startups, I've worked in publicly traded uh, companies, uh, you know, brief stint in academia and, and now doing a run in federal government. And so, of course, I've, from my experience, I've developed my own opinions and I'd be happy to share. And when they are my opinions, they are my own. Um, so the, the perimeter, you know, has kind of been the historical defense point, right? That the, the intent to segment 
the, the trusted from the untrusted, the inside from the outside, uh, and in large part has kind of evolved from non-connected networks, right? and, and then connecting them to less trusted spaces. And the government gets fairly good at building walls and moats and fences and guys with guns and dogs. And, and so we, we genuinely have this uh, idea and, and tradition or inertia of, you know, that's where we put the defenses. Uh, but technologies change the perimeter. Um, you know, cloud, mobility, uh, these kind of disruptive technologies where our data is going to any and all places. Um, we still have that need for defense. Uh, and um, DHS has several of the programs that are responsible for perimeter defense for the, the civilian government. Um, and we've got to recognize that there's a distinct need to change, uh, you know, of course, the amount of time you've spent with program, the federal government spends a lot of time on most things. Uh, and what we really need to continue to defend our data uh, is visibility into who is doing what from where and when, uh, and the, the tactical ability to um, exercise controls um, over that or to be disruptive um, or to be protective. So wherever that perimeter might be, wherever the security stack might go, uh, and you know we're, we're slowly evolving from the we've built, we control, we have some point that we're pulling all of our data through in order to see it and in order to protect it, uh, to having maybe multiple points, having uh, defenses that are provided as a service. As long as we can maintain that visibility and that um, you know, defensive control at the tactical level, uh, we're, we're getting to the point where we, we can work with that. Um, pulling it all together is, is typically the challenge and, and giving the, our network defenders the tools to defend a multi-point or a, a amorphous perimeter uh, is, is the challenge that we're presently working with. So just in segue to that, you know, we're talking obviously about cyber defense and cybersecurity. Um, you know, Scott, I, AWS is, is really excited about the work of the Virginia uh, cyber range. And I, you mentioned it briefly earlier, but I'd love for you to share maybe a little bit more about what it is. And, and I think it's also an interesting point, if you don't mind sharing how it's funded. Okay. And so uh, the Virginia Cyber Range has been in existence for less than a year. Uh, initially, we were funded by uh, legislative action for the, for the budget. And so we have funding for uh, the current fiscal year, which ends uh, end of this month and for in Virginia and the coming fiscal year. And that's really sort of our startup seed funding, if you will, will and we're moving towards sustainability. And I'll come back to sustainability in just a minute. Um, but one of the things that's been recognized as we look at really trying to increase the number of, of students uh, who have opportunities to uh, take cybersecurity classes and as we really try to provide good experience for those students, that hands-on experiential learning is absolutely important, right? So uh, the lecture, the classroom only goes so far in terms of preparing students to be able to uh, really understand and be productive in cybersecurity positions or positions where cybersecurity is important, which is many positions. And so this need was recognized by the state and uh, we were asked to bring together a group of universities. So in fact, uh, this is being uh, sort of led by all the uh, universities and community colleges in Virginia that have uh, DHS, NSA, uh, Center of Academic Excellence uh, certification of some type. Uh, so we, we have that in research and more recently cyber operations and uh, a number of other uh, universities and community colleges in Virginia have that. So that really forms the, the inner circle, if you will, the executive committee and Virginia Tech is then executing this. As we looked at uh, what we wanted to provide, we wanted to provide uh, curriculum material, not teaching the class, but to provide resources for faculty, to provide exercises, projects, competitions, frameworks for those that faculty could access. And then really most importantly, a facility where they could go and run those exercises. 
And there have been a number of, of other uh, cyber ranges out there. Some of the cyber ranges that uh, you may be more familiar with, for example, in DOD, relate really to being able to test and exercise various kinds of things, not as much of a learning environment, some training perhaps. We wanted to focus very much on education. Um, and in doing that and looking at sustainability, uh, we chose to do a cloud implementation. So we didn't go out and buy a bunch of servers to run virtual machines on and so forth and give access to people around the state. Instead, we're, we're running this in the cloud. Uh, we have a very good partnership with uh, AWS where they have supported uh, our activity through uh, generous allowance of credits. And really, I think more important, uh, not that that's not important, that's important, but more important is the, uh, the technical support that we've gotten from AWS because we really are doing things that are, uh, you know, you're not supposed to do uh, because we want to create environments where, you know, students are able to do attacks and make defenses and doing all this in, in a virtual private cloud. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the technical details. Actually, there's a, Russ is in the audience here, and if, uh, if you want technical details, I'll, I'll introduce you to Russ, uh, who is our uh, lead architect for the Virginia Cyber Range. Uh, so we, we have this combination of uh, generous state support really for seed funding, and then we have uh, AWS support, both technical and uh, credits to help us get going as well. And uh, we think we're gonna be in a place by the end of the two years where uh, we're able to run very efficiently, deliver services when needed, and uh, to be able to be sustainable and grow uh, through a variety of sources uh, to make sure that we really support uh, K-12 and community colleges and higher ed. And I'll just add in that uh, you know, at Virginia Tech, we've had cybersecurity education programs for a number of years, and we've run our own infrastructure to support that. Uh, so we're looking forward to getting out of that business. If we go to the other extreme, and, and we're working with high school teachers, for example, so we'll have high school teachers in during the summer in a gen cyber camp. They'll learn some things. They want to go back and take their students through some of those. And of course, their IT organization says, no, not on our network. And uh, with the cyber range, we're really going to be in a position to where all you need is internet access and a browser. And uh, all the weird stuff will happen out in, out in the cloud in the Virginia cyber range. So we're really looking forward to the impact this can have. Uh, not only in higher education, but with high schools especially. So I want to transition from, uh, if you will, educating um, kind of cloud security or cybersecurity professionals to using those professionals to actually implement security. So, John, I'll come to you. Um, so FINRA, you know, for folks that have been following FINRA's story and, and certainly the, um, the presentations that have been done over the past few years, um, you're aware that FINRA has a, a very sophisticated kind of cybersecurity operation. And so I'd, I'd just like to ask how you think about security in the cloud and, and what your thoughts are about how you can be more secure in the cloud. So it started off about four years ago. We were kind of running into a problem in our own you know, on-premises data centers. We were outgrowing the data warehouse technology we were using at the time and we're facing you know, this decision. Do we spend tens of millions of dollars to invest more in physical hardware capability uh, or do we consider adopting cloud, open source, big data platforms, um, and, and moving our market reg operation in particular to the cloud, which represents about 90% of the data footprint at FINRA. So when we first started evaluating those options, you know, at the time, cloud was something most organizations were ignoring. They were, they were saying it can't be trusted. You know, why would you ever want to do that? You're crazy if you're going to the cloud. You know, and, and that, my attitude at the time was, well, can we at least convince ourselves that it's no worse than our own data centers? That was really the, the start of the rationale. Um, and it only took about 10 minutes to realize that, well, yeah, it's at least as secure as what we're doing today. And there's a lot of opportunity in front of us. And so talking about this more from that opportunity perspective, um, you know, I, the things that I've learned over the last four years as we've transitioned to the cloud are you know, I, I think the biggest one is as a small organization, which FINRA is a relatively small organization, we can be far more secure in the cloud in the sense that it costs us a lot less to achieve a high level of assurance, um, both in terms of effort and in dollars invested. So good examples of that 
you know, the key management service that Amazon offers. If, if I was to build that myself, procuring technology, putting it into our data centers, at the scale in terms of performance and availability that Amazon does, supported with people that, you know, are solely focused on that, that specialization of skill, uh, which leads to high execution, it would cost me tens of millions of dollars per year just to do that. Right. They've made that investment. I just use it for how much is a key cost? Dollar um, a month. Dollar per CMK One dollar per key per month. And you don't need that many keys because those are the master keys. All your data encryption keys are free. Um, so that's just one example. I think another good example is just embracing automation. So in our own data centers four years ago, a server would arrive at the loading dock. And believe me, it did not arrive secure. Right? It had some OS that the vendor put on there with all services turned on. It was out of date already on patches. You know, you're crazy to plug that into your network. So you gotta invest hours to re-image it, rack it, stack it, assign an IP. You know, everything you gotta do. It takes, you know, even though we were tried to be efficient, it was roughly three to four weeks from order to server live. And that was about the best you could do back then. Now it's three or four minutes, right? So we've embraced automation completely with orchestration, so deploying machine images. Nobody logs into the web console and does that. We just run a script. Um, deploying apps on top of those machine image, the script just continues to run and does that. Deploying my security tools on those is also part of that automated deployment script. And we've, had, we've chosen tools. We've gone through a little bit of retooling uh, during this time to choose tools that are cloud friendly ones, for example, that self-register. So uh, the agent would start up and say, you know, I gotta find out where my console is, I gotta tell it who I am, what my role is in the network, and I gotta download my, download my policy and start executing it. So tools, security tools four or five years ago didn't work that way. Now almost every vendor does. So that's something you wanna look for as, as you're moving to the cloud. Um, you know, and then, the, uh, you know, back to the point about a strong partner. So if you make a good choice about who your cloud partner is and their capabilities and what their trajectory is, it's probably the most important thing. Um, like I said, it, it, it amplifies what you as an organization can achieve. So, you know, we're able to achieve incredible levels of assurance in terms of consistencies of builds, uh, patching. You know, in, in the past, you ran big patch management systems and they had to scan your network and you hoped that they found everything and they hoped that when it found it, that the agent that was there responsible for patching actually worked. My experience has been about 96% of the time they do work and you spend a lot of your life dealing with that 4% of pain. In the cloud, we don't have those problems. So instead of taking that traditional approach to, uh, to patching, we just redeploy on new AMIs on a regular basis. And so it's just a reboot. And same is true about tech refresh. So rather than carting a whole bunch of new equipment in, spending months migrating your workloads to it, and then carting the old equipment out and making sure you shred it like you showed in the last session, um, you know, we don't have to do that anymore. It's just a reboot. You want to change to a new server type with more horsepower, more memory, you just boot on it with your automated deployment scripts and you're done. So it's, it's truly, truly profound what you can achieve uh, in this new world. So we, we've been uh, talking here before about security and I want to pivot a little bit to compliance. So um, in, in my career I've experienced, I'm sure many in the audience have, uh, occasions where the answer to a question you have, the question being, well, why have we done that? The answer is, well, there's this box on a form I have to check. Right. So <laughs> the UK is taking a different approach to that. So Richard, I'm, I'm wondering if you can kind of share with the audience this notion of, I believe you call it principle-based decision making, what that's about and, and how you think about compliance. Okay, cool. So we, we've been on a bit of a journey in UK government around cloud security. We used to have um, a compliance regime where we had kind of two levels of security uh, that different cloud service providers could show that they, they met one or the other and there was quite a lot of um, auditing around the, the top level. But what we, what we found with that is um, when it came to public sector organizations trying to adopt the cloud, they, they kind of 
just looked for the, the services that had that certificate in place rather than actually thought about what their, what their particular needs are and what the, the security properties that they needed for the, the service that they wanted to run in the cloud. And we found you know, organizations choosing to use a, a, a service that was inferior from a functionality perspective because, um, you know, because they were worried about that, not having that certificate in place. Now, the, the challenge that I had from the, the government CTO um, in the UK at the time was that we kind of, we were really hamstringing innovation in, in the UK public sector because of this, the very you know, small number of services that uh, government departments could build on. And we took that, we took that very seriously and kind of thought um, long and hard about a, a different approach that we could take that would allow departments to be a lot more, um, uh, to think a lot harder about what it is that they, they needed and then to um, make more services available. And this is the, the cloud-based, sorry, the, um, the principle-based decision-making approach, approach that we had. So instead of setting out a, a long list of controls that services need to meet to, to kind of get a certificate, we set out 14 principles um, that government organizations should think about um, and make a decision, a conscious decision against each, each of those principles when, they, when they're procuring a service. And these are things like uh, separation, so the level of, you know, the, the level of separation between um, their data or their, their um, processing and another, another customer of that service is processing as well. So really kind of some quite cloud specific uh, things, that concepts that they needed to consider. And we found um, that this approach has been quite uh, liberating for government departments. So there's, there's no one stopping, stopping them using anything that they want to use. They can um, build a case. They can you know, consider all of the, the risks associated with it and really understand what, what risk it is that they're taking when they, they use a different service. Very well. I, <clears throat> liberating indeed, I'm sure. Um, so, Matt, governments tend to be conservative, um, moving deliberately and adopting their approaches, and, and they tend to adopt uh, approaches that are well established. And so, you know, the challenge with the cloud is that cloud enables really kind of rapid innovation. And so, like, the question I want to get to is, you know, from a security perspective, how is it that, you know, governments Will, should think about security keeping pace with the rate at which the technology is now changing with cloud and serverless and things like that? Sure. Well, so innovation, right? Just to kind of cook that down into doing things a different, better way. Fair definition, right? Um, when the federal government has a lot of things it's doing, right? So. So innovation at scale is, is I think, really kind of the, the challenge. Um, and cloud has enabled a, a lot of innovation, but there's been uh, inertia to getting there and, and for, for departments and agencies and organizations to figure out you know, how to buy it, uh, how to architect it, how to install it, how to run it, and then you know, on top of all of that, how to secure it. Uh, and there certainly have been lots of forays into the cloud. We've got lots of systems there. And, and uh, some of them are, are doing fairly well, some of them are, are doing fairly not. Uh, but I think that, that the approach the federal government at large has been trying to reduce rework, right, to, to increase visibility and share some of the expertise that's being develop, developed, some of the, the lessons that are learned. Um, the FedRAMP program, uh, you know, tries to not only improve the, the trustworthiness of the compliance efforts uh, in cloud, but also the, the quality of that so that it can be more easily reused and, and reduce the rework that existed before that. But uh, it you know, had some inertia of its own uh, and started out doing the same thing that we were doing previously in Rack and Stack and Iron Systems for cloud uh, and had a guaranteed to get through model just not guaranteed how long that would take. Uh, and, and it often took a fairly long time, and, and you know, not for nothing, the, the cloud providers needed to learn how to do federal government work in the cloud as much as the federal government needed to learn how to do federal government work in the cloud. 
and uh, has re recently, um, from those lessons learned, has actually reworked things and gone from, if I'm getting the numbers right, a security authorization for a cloud system that would come to the joint authorization board, which kind of asserts, uh, uh, you know, no unmitigated high to all federal standards kind of setting. Um, averaging was a year to a year and a half for that security authorization, very not cloud, but um, not uh, an order of magnitude more than the way federal government does things. Uh, to actually getting those security authorizations done in four, five, maybe six months with a good month or more of kind of um, delta work, right, to actually do some remediation if there's things, that issues that are found to fix those issues and then get, it, get authorized. Um, innovation federal wide, there's lots of space to innovate, um, but it Re it responsibly, from my point of view, tends to be around the new things that we're doing um, or the, you know, kind of lower impact, smaller, the, the things we genuinely don't care so much about. Um, or the things where the state that we're in is already broken enough that we're going to have to go through some, whether we call it a transformation effort or modernization effort or whatever the key words are for we got to rebuild the thing. Uh, then, then we can take a look at, at redoing that in the cloud. Um, uh, FedRAMP has actually taken a, a crack federal wide at well, what do we what can we really do with some of that space where we want to be faster, we want to be more cloud, we want to be more innovative, uh, and it's it's you know the things that aren't inherently sensitive, the things that we genuinely do care less about. Uh, and so I think uh, presently out for, for public comment, there's a, a, a FedRAMP tailored security authorization process and baseline for uh, software as a service, low impact, no personally identifiable information, no sensitive data, you know, the, the very common case, but fairly less sensitive um, situation where we can take kind of the, the principled approach where we can say, you know what, from what we know of this service, they are doing the things they should be doing. We don't need to you know, go in and, and audit and recheck all of the things. Um, we just need them to attest to us they're doing the best practices, the goodness, and the important bits uh, we are actually going to kind of put some risk-based decisions around. Uh, so that, that could be some, some facilitating uh, still meeting the level of security that's required for federal use and some of the compliance of situations that we're in, but getting that, you know, kind of faster, faster to market. Um, you know, that, that small startups innovate fairly easily, um, not for nothing, because the developers are like, you know, coding and production and, uh, and, you know, dot com days, we didn't think you really were part of the family until you brought the system down, right, from hitting the wrong enter on the wrong thing, uh, but we were quick to market, right? And we, it was a race, and we were trying to provide functionality and capability to people before the next guy in a space where everything went really fast. But you take a look at that, as soon as, as, soon as you've proven the model, right? As soon as you're making a profit, then come the controls and the policies and the things that are designed so that you don't have one guy with an enter key who can take it all down. And federal government isn't particularly different. It's just an awfully large scale, right? The, the U.S. government's the largest enterprise on the planet. Um, so, you know, we, we tend to have systems that are responsible for people's lives and, you know, livelihood and financial ruin and certain things that are where we genuinely are going to continue to have uh, controls and process and things in place um, to be responsible to the, the people's trust. Uh, but there's lots of space still to innovate, lots of space to learn how to do things in a new, better way. Uh, and then we can apply those same principles and those same expertise and skills that we build in our people to larger scales and, and more important and sensitive systems. I, th I think it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> there, there are a lot of parallels, and this is for Scott, there are a lot of parallels between kind of the notion of you know, DHS and, and candidly FedRAMP and a kind of a central body that's defining kind of a, a view of security and, and uh, I'll say, 
codes of practice, if you will, um, that's then being implemented kind of individually by different agencies. And what I see kind of over and over in higher ed, which is, you know, there's, you know, kind of a central IT, and then there are departments and researchers that, that all kind of have their own kind of uh, needs. But this notion of, if you will, kind of shared responsibility with respect to security delivery seems to be kind of common. So I, I'd wonder if you would you'd share tenants or strategies that you're using at Virginia Tech to kind of balance this kind of distributed security model and, and flexibility as well. Yeah, so, so I think there, there are kind of two things that are very common at research universities, and I, I, I like Matt's analogy about the border with the dogs and the guards and everything, because the typical U.S. university has never had that kind of physical security, right? It's all very open campuses, buildings are very open, and it's really up to the faculty member, if you will, or the lab owner to lock your door and have security at that level. And so traditionally, that's been our approach, that we, we have a very sort of open network border for most of our network, and it's really up to the, uh, the, the lab, the faculty member, the functional unit to make sure that their infrastructure is secure at that level. We certainly have areas where we have to deal with uh, compliance issues, the whole alphabet suit of, of compliance we have many of those in, in play at the university. But what also then makes it challenging is uh, the fact that um, there are lots of people that do not report to me that are responsible for that, that have to, let, let me reword that, there are lots of people that, re, that do not report to me that we rely on to implement security, but yet then I'm responsible for it. Um, so it's sort of the, the buck stops here. and. We approach that really in, in a multiple ways. So obviously we have policy standards and guidelines that we promulgate out uh, to different units and to make sure they understand what responsibilities are. We have data trustees and data stewards that are out in functional units that have responsibility in terms of making sure compliance in their area is being met. Uh, so we have these policies. We, we tell people what to do. We have training and so forth to help them understand that as well. Um, and then another thing that we do is try to provide uh, common support. So for example, uh, we have uh, multi-factor, two-factor authentication for all of our faculty, staff, and students, and our central systems are all pretty much there. Um, and we are then working with our distributed units to let them use that same capability. They don't have to go out and implement two-factor. They have to only integrate two-factor into the systems that they're running. So that's just one example of an area where we can provide some services that let those distributed IT organizations uh, provide secure environments. And then I think the third and, and final piece that I'll highlight is really understanding what's going on in our network. And so we don't do a lot of intrusion prevention, except in some special areas, but we do a lot of intrusion detection, if you will. So we do a lot of monitoring of our network, logging, analysis on that, to understand what's happening uh, in our network and to be able to then identify uh, issues that might be on a distributed IT server and then we can take action on that, whether it's contacting the person or shutting it down directly. Uh, we have not perfect in terms of, you know, I'm not sure if it's uh, what the percentage is, but we have pretty good understanding of uh, who's responsible for what, or at least who's responsible for a particular part of the network or port that's, that's being accessed. And so that uh, monitoring is very important. And as we uh, start to deploy uh, enterprise systems and distributed, uh, and distributed IT systems into the cloud, that becomes kind of a challenge that we have to, have to face to uh, make sure that we have that same kind of monitoring and visibility in a different way now, but uh, in, in the cloud, and, and to be able to uh, help our distributed IT units that are moving things into the cloud to have that capability as well. Very well, so uh, I want to move to <clears throat> just a topic about credential management. We have customers, uh, you know, when they start the journey, one of the things that customers ask a lot about is Kind of governance and kind of what's the right way, if you will, to provision users and to manage users. So, um, John, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about um, 
how FINRA addresses credential management. You mentioned earlier that you know, folks don't really log into systems, so do they, do they never log into systems? Is there a way to log into systems? Like, how do you deal with credential management? Is that built on AWS? Is it a kind of a hybrid of capabilities AWS provides in those you've built in-house? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, so I think you're primarily asking about the credentials used to administer infrastructure, Correct. right? So yeah. back-end yeah. access. Um, front end we do through you know a different mechanism, but in terms of accessing resources that we've deployed within Amazon, um, what we've chosen to do is what I'm sure most of your customers choose to do, and that is to federate with an existing identity store. So we use Active Directory in internally. Um, we use your SAML sign-on service to federate. We define roles in the AWS IAM service, and our approach to defining the roles, you know what how many different roles we've chosen to define and what entitlements we offer within those is really kind of the, the topic of a governance activity. We have a cloud compliance working group that meets weekly, and it's a cross-functional group. It has our DevOps teams, it has server admins, data admins, it has my security team involved in it. Um, and so there are asks, and there are, sometimes we say yes to the ask as is, sometimes we, we um, change it a little bit, but we've really na nailed it down to about a dozen roles that, that range from you know, pure developer to software tester to the DevOps automation pipeline administration team, uh, information security, internal audit can inherit a compliance role so they can go look at all the infrastructure in a, in a read-only sense. Um, and a few other roles like networking is responsible for setting up uh, load balancers and things like that. Uh, and probably the most important thing in this role definition is looking at the ability to change or delete, permanently delete data. So we've, we've chosen to make it all those normal operational roles have no ability to permanently destroy data. And we've created this master destroy role, which is usually not populated by any individual. So it's a role just sitting out there uh, and then when we have a need to clean up data, uh, we go through an approval process, you know, with a change ticket, and then someone will be placed into that role, they'll do their work, they'll be supervised as they're doing it, and then when they're done, they're taken back out of the role. So it reduces the risk, and man, many of you may have heard of a company called Code Spaces, which doesn't exist anymore because they ran out of the cloud, they didn't manage identity well, and one of their former employees deleted everything. Uh, and they called Amazon up and said, hey, can you restore our data? And I think since they don't exa exist anymore, I think you know the answer that, that when these guys say they can't really do anything with our data, they truly can't. Uh, if we destroy it, it's gone forever. Um, but that governance activity, you know, produces kind of a gold source of desired Entitlements, and we, we aim for least privileges and then separation of duties, as I was describing with like data destruction, but also other things. Um, and, and having a good plan gets you halfway there. On top of that, we've written some custom compliance tools that go and, and they interrogate the AWS IAM roles that we've defined, pull them into a system, and compare them against the gold source that we manage through that cloud compliance working group. And it produces two different types of output. One, where we've given more privileges than intended, which is obviously a security concern, but then also where we have failed to give a privilege that was agreed upon. That represents an operational risk. Somebody who thinks they can go do something at the time when they need to do it, and they go and try to do it, and they get an error because they don't have the permission, that's a problem too. So we look at both sides of those, and we're trying to, you know, we're always working each week to correct where we've made mistakes. And really our next step in this will be full automation. So we'll actually have code that takes that gold source and just implements it. Um, so we're real close to doing that today. Yeah, automation, <clears throat> you'll hear that as a, as a theme from really everybody at, at Amazon and, and from our customers that are really kind of the most uh, advanced on the platform. Automation is um, quite material in terms of your ability to be uh, secure in the cloud. And, and, even generally, even on-prem, but uh, automation is, is very key in keeping kind of the people out of the loop. So we, we just have a few minutes left here, and so maybe I'll kind of go down the panel here. Um, so if you look into the future, 
What do you think will move the needle the most in the way that you protect these cloud-based environments? Uh, I think, uh, I actually think that there's probably just a few nuts to the federal government sort of really flooding into um, emergent technologies, being able to figure out, you know, how we maintain that, that network defense level of, of visibility and, and kind of tactical defense um, with our cloud resources, uh, that the, the government is, you know, just presently getting a handle around our own systems and data centers and, and in, a, in a way to fill the gaps we had previously. Um, the, the DHS program for continuous diagnostics and mitigation is giving departments and agencies visibility to every IP addressable device they've got on their network. Um, where previously your authoritative source was, you know, what have you got? Well, who knows what we bought? Right? We'll ask them. Um, whereas, next step, we're taking a look at how do we incorporate cloud systems? How do we incorporate cloud resources uh, and you know, mobility into that same picture of what have I got and what is the risk? Uh, so as we work with our cloud partners, to get the right data elements back and forth, um, to get the right capabilities in place so that we can um, have that risk picture and make decisions independent of the technology that's underlying the system. Uh, I think that we'll get to the point where the facility to do systems securely in whatever environment um, we, we have it or want to put it, uh, I think that, that we will actually just um, uh, we may even be ahead of the folks who learn how to buy cloud resources fast and easy. Uh, so it's, that horizon, I think, is, is fairly soon. Um, the, the growth and the change that that enables, I think we may actually see a different way of um, a sh uh, proving you know, security of a system. Uh, or auditing or have, maintaining that visibility. I think that the government really will change um, for the better um, how we protect our data and our systems and how we manage that risk in a way that will be uh, more real time, um, easier to change, and faster uh, to keep up with some of the technologies that are, that are aligned for those same purposes. Great. Richard. I guess I'd give a, a similar answer. I think the biggest problem that we've got today, when, when asked the question, you know, are we secure enough? Um, the biggest chat, the biggest kind of hurdle to answering that question is knowing what we've got. So being confident that we know what all of our um, our footprint on the internet is in terms of the the I don't know the the, um, the enterprise IT that we've got that's connected to the internet, the websites that we've got, do we know what they all are? What are our IP addresses? What are the domains that we use? What are our dependencies on third parties? So which payment providers are we using? Which services? Which um, you know, DNS providers are we using? Which CDN providers are we using? What are all of those dependencies that we're reliant on for security? Um, that's the, the toughest problem that we've got. And I think with um, of the, a lot of move to the cloud, we're able to get better insights into that stuff. So we, you know, I can see um, a scenario in a, a couple of years' time where we'd be able to run a query and get a very quick answer to, to the answer of, you know, what, what um, in the UK government infrastructure, what do we have that's listening, you know, to, on SMB um, that would have really helped us in the, the kind of WannaCry incident. And I want to be able to answer those sorts of questions in the future. So for me, two things jump to mind. One um, you know, is, is continuing to find ways to minimize the attack surface area. So you know, micro-segmentation in the cloud is something very easy to do. And if, if you haven't started trying to do that in your organizations, find out what it is, invest the time and energy into it. It reduces this, the network security exposure to a bare minimum. Um, but then another, I think, is more of an ecosystem thing. And, and Richard, you, you hit on something that you're doing you know, to help secure 
government entities in the UK, which I think there's an opportunity for Amazon and any cloud operator, you know, as more things move into the cloud, you have more security visibility into attacker traffic, um, and then, you know, you have the opportunity to create services that help entities operating out of your cloud to, to achieve, you know, better protections with less effort and less cost, which is really what, you know, capitalism's all about, right? Um, so, and drive more shareholder value for investors, which is good, good for FINRA since we want the stock markets to be fair and, and transparent and serving all of us. Um, but the point on that ecosystem one is that, you know, I think there's an opportunity to be able to detect and, and redirect attackers um, just in the way Richard was describing, you know, detecting and, re and redirecting, you know, victims to less, uh, less dangerous sites. So would love to see the ecosystem focus on that. And I'll give a little bit of a self-serving answer because I think higher ed is, is part of the solution and that's workforce in one word. So I think it's very important that uh, we in higher education and other entities uh, make sure that uh, we have uh, folks out there that are prepared for uh, R&D operations, management policy, and uh, to make sure that that's, uh, those people are ready for not just today's technology or yesterday's technology, but future technologies and uh, moving to the cloud and other kind of issues. Uh, so workforce. Well, I want to again thank the panelists. Uh, it was great to have you. I hope that the audience found this to be uh, interesting and valuable, and uh, I hope that you enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you so much. Thank you.